Would the congregation please stand? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, source of all mercy and the God of all consolation. He comforts us in all our sorrows so that we can comfort others in their sorrows with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. Thanks be to God. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, who formed us from the dust of the earth who by your breath gave us life, we glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who suffered death for all humanity, who rose from the grave to open the way to eternal life, we praise you. Holy Spirit, author and giver of life, the comforter of all who sorrow, our sure confidence and everlasting hope, we worship you. To you, O blessed Trinity, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our brother Arlen. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we may live in confidence and hope until by your call, we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all your saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. I am beyond honored to have been asked by the Erdahl family to offer a remembrance of their dad and granddad. When I served in Congress, I aspired to be viewed as a legislator in the mold of my predecessor, Arlen Erdahl, and for that matter, his predecessor, Al Kui, who we also recently lost. Both of these gentlemen served Southern Minnesota with diligence and distinction. I grew up in a Democratic household and considered myself then a moderate Democrat, though now I am earnestly independent. However, in my youth, I always respected and appreciated the thoughtful and nonpartisan style of leadership provided by both Arlen and Al. They were the kind of public servants that we yearned for in today's fiercely polarized world of politics. One of my most treasured photos is of the three of us together at a public policy function several years back, and I see that the family has put that photo uh, on the photo table outside this room. I first came to know Arlen when he represented my hometown of Keister in the state legislature. Keister is just 20 miles down the road from Frost. I also crossed paths with him after his election as Minnesota Secretary of State. I worked at the state capitol at that time as a college intern and uh, stopped by his office on several occasions when family or friends were visiting St. Paul. He was always, always gracious with his time on those occasions. A few years later, when I was a member of the Minnesota State Senate, I had the opportunity to affirm Arlen as a member of the Public Utilities Commission. I expressed at the Commerce Committee meeting my strong admiration for Arlen's commitment to public service and proudly supported his nomination. After Alcui's election as governor in 1978, Arlen went on to serve Southern Minnesota Congress in Congress and did so with independent judgment and common sense and not just a little bit of political courage when from time to time he wouldn't necessarily vote the party line. After the 1980 census, Arlen was placed in competition for renomination with another Republican, Tom Hagedorn, and was not endorsed for re-election by his party. Frankly, I entered that race in 1982 as a candidate in the hope that I would not face Arlen in the general election. After he lost the renomination from his party, I actually asked for an appointment with him in his Rochester office. And I urged him to do what he wanted to do, not what he thought his party wanted him to do. Because many Republican leaders were eager to have him run for re-election in a newly created district north and east of the Twin Cities. I also told him that if he stayed in the first district, I expected he would win the primary, and then he would beat me in the general election. I recall telling him that if we faced one another, it would be a civil, respectful, and cordial campaign because, frankly, I did not have 
any real objection to the way he voted or the way he served the district. I was talking to Arlen Whitrock just a, a few moments ago, and Arlen uh, told me that in all of uh, his boss's campaigns, he never once ran a negative ad. Boy, if we could return to those days. And I tried to follow that example as well, never once in all of my nine campaigns running a negative ad. When Arlen ultimately decided to run in the 6th District, a race that he almost won, I was then able to present myself in southern Minnesota as the sensible, moderate candidate in the mold of Arlen Erdahl, in contrast to a Republican opponent, Tom Hagedorn, who was more stridently conservative. I recall then telling numerous audiences that I was following in the footsteps of many decades of Norwegian Lutheran Republicans representing southern <laughs> Minnesota, and that as a Norwegian Lutheran Democrat, I checked two boxes, isn't that good enough? <laughs> Toward the end of the campaign, I remember the Rochester newspaper had a cartoon on the editorial page, and it depicted two trick-or-treaters at, at a door in town, and the caption read, Honey, come and look, it's Timmy and Tommy in their Arlen Erdahl masks. One campaign memory does stand out. In the middle of that summer, there was a major gathering of senior citizens in Lanesboro, Minnesota. Naturally, a huge opportunity to meet and greet an awful lot of people in a short period of time. I attended, I mixed, I mingled, I gave my remarks, and then I saw Arlen drive up in a car festooned with his campaign signs. Even though he was running for election in another district, east and north of the Twin Cities. He traveled all the way to Lanesboro because he had promised this group he would attend. And after all, he was still their congressman at that time. But I was impressed, though not surprised, that he would take time away from his campaign in the 6th District to spend valuable time with constituents who would not be able to vote for him that November. His trip that day demonstrated to me once again that Arlen Erdahl was a fine public servant and a good-hearted man. I won that congressional race and during my 12 years in Congress was always mindful of carrying on the Erdahl tradition of dedication to the people who elected me, of moderation, and of bipartisanship. As we all know, Arlen went on to serve in the Peace Corps during the Reagan years and later returned to Minnesota to head up the Minnesota Health Volunteers, International Health Volunteers. These post-elective pursuits provide additional evidence that his heart was always, always dedicated to public service. In more recent years, I always enjoyed crossing paths with Arlen at various events, including at the annual turtle picnic sponsored by our mutual friend Richard Kleinbaum. I always knew of his deep and abiding faith. I always knew of his love for family, especially for his lovely wife Ellen, who sadly we lost earlier this year as well. And so for the family, this is a uh, an especially difficult day, having lost both a mother and a grandmother, a father and a grandfather, in such a short period of time. But both Ellen and Arlen live on in their children and through their grandchildren. We all know, reflecting on his life, that he was a role model for all of us to follow. And I am forever grateful that he served as a role model for me. Thank you, Tim Penny, for your kind and thoughtful and especially for your humorous words. Thanks to all of you who came here. Thanks to all of you who are watching via YouTube. 
Tusen takk til våre nære og kjære slektninger og venner i Norge. Enn til de her mares i Japan. Arigato gozaimashita. I am Rolf Erdahl, Ireland and Ellen's first child. And dad was the most positive person I've ever known. And I think one secret to his positive attitude was his ever-present sense of humor. In preparing the various visitation displays, we kids found it very hard to find a picture of dad where he wasn't smiling or laughing, but blue eyes twinkling. Dad knew life could be hard, and he had his share of disappointments. He somehow always transformed these setbacks into empathy for other people rather than to self-pity. He even responded to his Alzheimer's diagnosis with, just because I have dementia doesn't mean I have to be down in the dumps about it. <laughs> he was always a master at keeping things light. Through our college days, he would frequently mail each of us kids short, breezy notes just a half sheet of paper, and at the end of them, he would always sign off with the initials LFUA. Love from us all. Dad took civic and family duties very seriously, but never himself. Like his favorite comedian, Red Skelton, Dad poked fun at himself laughed at his own jokes, and often repeated punchlines. Red always ended his television programs with his signature tagline, Good night and God bless. Dad also consistently used humor as a kind of life and laugh affirming benediction. He liked shaggy dog stories where punchlines took you somewhere unexpected. This is maybe why he loved Jesus' shaggy dog stories, better known as parables. Dad and his twin brother Lowell especially took heart to the message, love your neighbor as yourself from the Good Samaritan parable, and saw everyone they met as their neighbor, responsibility, and potential friend. This resulted in a compassionate kind of humor that never came at the expense of someone else with put-down humor. They were adamant about that. Dad also emulated his political hero, Abraham Lincoln, who was famed for using humor to diffuse situations, disarm oppositions, and make a point, often at the same time as making a friend. Lincoln once famously responded to a cruel joke about a short person by saying, his feet are long enough to reach the ground. That's tall enough for anybody. Dad didn't do jokes at the expense of other ethnicities. He often told stories using a long forgotten or extinct tribe as the subject of his jokes. So, for, for example, there were these two Hittites, Uli and Lena. So as Uli was drawing toward the end of his life and mostly confined to bed, he caught an amazing aroma wafting in from the kitchen. It was Lena's rhubarb pie, fresh from the oven. He so wanted one more piece of that delicacy, he summoned all his strength, gathered himself up, and made his way to the kitchen. He was about to cut up himself a piece of the pie when Lena came in and said, Oli, put that down. We're saving that for the funeral. <laughs> a few days later, Oli was clearly in his last hours, so family gathered. Oli opened his eyes and said, Nina, are you here? She took his hand and replied, Yeah, Oli, I'm right here beside you. Are our children here? Yeah, Oli, all our kids and all the grandkids too. Well, Nina, if everybody's in here, why are the lights still on in the kitchen? <laughs> After Oli passed away, Lena went to the newspaper to place the obituary. When the editor asked how she would like it to read, she said, Oh, keep it simple. You say, 
Uli died. The editor says, but Lena, you and Uli had such a good long life together. Surely you can come with more things to say. The newspaper gives you five words for free. Lena thought a bit and she said, okay, uh, Uli died. Both for sale. <laughs> In reality, this has been a tough and sad time. Losing both parents in a few months. But I think dad and mom would expect us, <laughs> pardon me, to stride forward with optimistic good humor and not let ourselves be down in the dumps too long. <laughs> Other stories can keep for later. For now, I'll close with love from us all, and good night, and God bless. Hi, I'm Eric, kid number two. Uh, thank you so much for being here to remember Dad Arwen. Um, welcome to those who've traveled far to come here, such as Mr. and Mrs. Khan from Washington, D.C., and family friends. Uh, they're also immigrants from Pakistan, and uh, glad to have uh, the Whitrocks here from Colorado, and many others have probably traveled long distances as well. I kind of got used to Dad being around. So, I'm going to miss him. I know if uh, Dad were here, though, he'd look around the crowd and he'd say, there are more Erdals here than decent people. <laughs> Dad and his twin brother's Lowell's character and values are rooted in his upbringing in a farm around southern Minnesota, down by Blue Earth, located between Frost and Brush Creek but closer to Dell. Of course, these values continued to de develop through their life of experiences. His mother immigrated from Norway in 1913 at the age of 21. His father was born here in 1882, but to parents from the same lake that Inga came from in the uh, Opstreen area of Norfjord. Dad had a love of nature, treated all treated people of all walks of life with dignity and respect, and he had a curiosity and enthusiasm about many things. Some life influencers were well-read aunts, uncles, and cousins for discussions about uh, philosophy, various issues of the day, and there were neighbors and work hands to add depth to their uh, relationships and some humorous stories. Um, and like I mentioned, he had his parents to learn from. And one lesson was after somewhat eccentric mechanic, Jesse Jonke, was committed to a state hospital in St. Peter for some sort of uh, incident. Grandpa Christ went there and got him out. He told the doctor, he's no crazier than you or me. Uh, throughout Dad's career, He'd take time to talk to and get to know building security guards, custodians, and other laborers. He never talked disparagingly about working people. He had a great disdain for anyone who would ridicule someone with physical or mental challenges. Uh, he often said he had a good education at both Harvard and St. Olaf, but he said the most important teacher was the first, in the first grade of the one-room schoolhouse because she taught him how to read. That was his Aunt Dorothy. Dad married Mom in 1958, and we kids got to know him as an encouraging and enthusiastic father. I guess he got that from his parents, but uh, surely by witnessing what can get done by regular people working together. Uh, their mother, Inga, told his brother, Lowell, you can do it in regards to overcoming his stuttering. He later became an accomplished debater and preacher. Not necessarily, um, or excuse me, when we kids 
had thoughts of doing something new, Dad would often say, give it a try. You can do it. Not necessarily endorsements of any special abilities we had, but rather reflecting his faith in what average people can do when participating, along with some tenacity and effort. Mom and Dad regularly encouraged us to uh, do your best. Uh, some years ago, when visiting the Lake City home of Mom's cousin, Char Rowe, her Jer husband, Jerry Narvison, highlighted Dad's enthusiasm. No he noted uh, the Greek and Latin roots of the word as uh, God within, or some such thing. Rolf could expand or correct me. <clears throat> and he, uh, but Dad did exude a certain uh, encouraging enthusiasm in a contagious manner, uh, perhaps opening a little window onto his soul. As Dad and grew up on the farm, they learned to appreciate simple things in life. They'd do hard work, but take pauses to observe the uh, natural world, the uh, vast expanse of the Milky Way, plants, animal beh behavior, approaching storms. And when Dad, bow and arrow hunting with Dad, he'd adv always advise walking through the woods to, to stop, look, and listen. And of course, I was also instructed to f step in some fresh deer droppings to mask my scent. And throughout Dad's life, he often studied the clouds, imagining various beasts or land or uh, of land or sea. That's a practice we kids, I think, all continue with. Observing and Im imagining was part of learning. When I was eight years old, after Sunday noon dinner with Dale and Marion Erdahl's family, I, I remember Dad stopping the car at the, end of the, excuse me, at the end of their driveway. Here we paused at length to enjoy the uh, beautiful singing of a song sparrow. Dad was teaching us how to appreciate one little part of nature, and also a lesson about time for impatient kids. When we were young, he would some, we'd sometimes hear him comment, kids have no conception of time. Dad himself was not shy of singing, though a bit off key. And actually his tone improved when older, and he knew many hymns by memory. Mom and Dad were great at including us kids in all kinds of activities as we grew up, caring for dogs, cats, pigs, chickens, geese, and we hit the campaign trail, county fairs, and some had the experience of living in Jamaica. Dad had a keen interest in international fairs um, from serving in Japan during 1954 after the end of the Korean War and he traveled the countryside, seeing similarities and differences of cultures. He taught Mr. Hamada some English, and they've maintained a friendship for 68 years. And Mr. and Mrs. Hamada are now 98 and 96. When we were young, Dad was once heading out of the farmhouse carrying a globe, used to be used as a prop for a speech, Little brother John, who's heard this story many times, had asked, what are you going to do with my world? Which is a good, end up being a good, uh, good line, and Dad used that for many speeches over the years to stress the importance of international relations. And so, uh, and nowadays, uh, time of war, we uh, hope that all parties do the hard work and find peace for the people of Israel and Palestine. While well, working in Congress, Peace Corps, Department of Energy, and also WellShare, formerly the uh, Minnesota International Health Volunteers, nonprofit here, and as a retired member of Congress, Dad traveled to a number of countries, and along the way, Mom and Dad have helped some Im immigrants financially and others finding jobs enriching our parents' lives with lifelong friendships. In, debt, in politics, Dad tried to find common ground to disagree without being disagreeable and be willing to compromise. 
At that time, you could have friendships across the aisle. Uh, campaigns were sometimes tough on family with accusations from opponents of both parties. Uh, I should, however, acknowledge that uh, the, in later years, both Joan Gro and Jerry Sikorsky have said nice and gracious things about Dad. Back about 2005, I had some sadness thinking about Dad's mortality. I realized we had probably gone on our last bow and arrow hunting trip for deer. Uh, 74, crawling up trees was too painful for his arthritic knee. Um, there's the last times you think of, the uh, last time cross-country skiing and going to Norway, age 83. Last time walking, age 80 or 91, but briefly this last February as well. Last trip to the farm down and back on August 15th, just two months ago. Uh, to remedy the folly of this short trip, I had hoped to try another two-night trip in early September, giving us a full day on the farm with no travel interruptions. Sadly, he was in the hospital then, and he ran out of time. Uh, Dad always kept the love of his heart, he kept his love of the farm, and 1970s onward as always the destination destination of choice for worker relaxation. Uh, and while he had Alzheimer's, it's a certainly a frustrating and sad disease. It helped me focus on enjoying the moment and then trying to facilitate as many moments as possible. Good for the parents and the rest of us family. In recent years, he had been insightful and empathetic in many ways. He tried to help fellow residents when they needed help. And across from mom's hospital day, one day before she died, early June, he motioned for me to cover up her arm and leg, recognizing uh, so that she could keep warm. So he recognized the problem and he directed a solution. And while our names of the kids may have escaped him in the last couple of years, he seemed comfortable and familiar with us. So I'm sure he knew who we were. Uh, Dad, at an earlier age, say 23, 24, when he was stationed in Japan, his parents were dad 73 and mom 63, so he, I think he had a, scene, a keen sense of mortality for them and maybe starting to think about his own. Many poems he memorized uh, um, talked about taking time and a pause to appreciate the simple, beautiful things in life such as Robert Frost stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Other poems were about the fleetingness of life, such as A.E. Houseman's Loveliest of Trees. Others dealt more directly with uh, death, such as Service's The Cremation of Sam McGee. And uh, a couple songs Dad liked also dealt with death themes, Ghost Riders in the Sky, The Streets of Laredo, I don't suggest that he was obsessed with death, but uh, he did like a variety of other songs, like those from Johnny Cash and uh, Harry Belfonte, which we sang a lot to him in his last days. And he also had uh, old Lena jokes concerning uh, about death and the afterlife. Um, and sometimes he didn't joke in Norwegian, Du kan sova no de, du er død. You can sleep when you're dead. So now he's resting in peace and sleep. Uh, perhaps a, a poem of dad contemplating the concept of time, the fleetingness of life, and <coughs> making the best of one times is not surprising. So here. Here's a little poem, no title. Dad wrote in the army, stationed in Japan, 1954 to 55. Uh, it says, tomorrow's last but for a while, and then become today. Today's brief seconds tick away, and we have yesterday. Yesterday, tomorrow, and today, and even time stands still. Now, before, and after, sums up lifespan of years. 
And you and I live on in three worlds, all wrapped up into one. And since to sail upon life's seas, I'll, I'll only have one chance. Let me see what I can do to make the trip worthwhile. And nothing do I ask, save upon, save upon my journey's end, that folks will look upon me and say, to man, he was a friend. I'm Lars, the fourth of the six Erdahl kids. On behalf of Rolf, Eric, John, Laura, and Kari, and Carrie, Molly, Scott, and the other Eric, and Ada, Ella, Inga, Anders, Hawk, and Tor, Bonnie, and Jake, Solve, Gemma, Jack, David, Ellen, Leif, and Annika, thank you for being here today to support us and to mourn with us as we remember and celebrate Arlen Erdahl. We all have life stories. Our dad had a really, really good life story. He told us that he was the top four of his class all the way up through eighth grade. <laughs> then he'd smirk, because back in the one-room schoolhouse in Emerald Township in Faribault County, there were only four in his grade, and three of them were Erdals. Dad, his twin brother Lowell, and their cousin Dale was like another brother. Sometime during those one-room schoolhouse years, Dad learned that words have power and beauty, and also humor. He developed a lifelong appreciation for poetry. Both he and his brother Lowell could recite many poems from memory throughout their lives. Like Eric mentioned, favorites like Robert Frost and also long epic poems like The Cremation of Sam McGee by Robert Service. We loved hearing that as kids. Dad saw beauty in words and also in people, places, culture, and simple, ordinary, everyday things. He wondered and marveled at, at clouds, stars, storms, lightning, thunder, sunshine, rain, snow, farm fields, livestock, changing seasons, birds, wildlife, migrations, music, and much more. He and our mom were a good team, a great team. They raised six pretty good kids, and have always loved, guided, encouraged, and supported all of us. Their 14 grandkids gave them so much joy. Please know and always remember that your grandpa loved you very much, and so did your grandma. In public service roles, Dad described himself as a fiscal conservative with a social conscience and he brought his farmer work ethic to public service. He spoke up and stood up for those who could not speak up or stand up for themselves. When elected, he understood that it was his responsibility to work for those who voted for him, for those who voted against him, and for those who didn't vote at all. He was a servant leader. Dad not only ran for office, he was also a runner in college and in the army. Exploring the archives of the Manitou Messenger student newspaper, I found a lot of articles about Dad's track and cross-country performances. Several articles, more than, many more than one, noted that he came in first place in the half mile, the mile, and the two mile races all in the same track meet. Both in running and in life, Dad paced himself well, and he was in good shape for the long distance. He ran a good race. During his final weeks, Dad was once again between exciting opportunities, between this life and the promise of life everlasting. We weren't always too sure what he heard or understood, but we told stories, talked about relatives here and in Norway, gave updates on the grandkids, and reminisced about family and friends from the farm and around the world. We played favorite hymns and music from Harry Belafonte, Johnny Cash, and others. We prayed, sang, laughed, cried, and we held his hands. We were there with him and there for him and for each other, doing the best that we could. Every time I left, I told him that we were so blessed and grateful to have him for our dad and that we'd take good care of each other. I asked him to give mom a big hug and tell her how much we love and miss her. 
I told him that he ran a good race, that he was rounding the bend and in the final kick. The finish line was just up ahead. I'd kiss him on the forehead and I'd rub it in so it would last for an extra long time. And I'd tell him that I loved him so much forever and ever and always. And talk for alt. But Dad's whole life story changed for me on September 18th. That's when his first grandchild, Bonnie, shared the news that she and her husband, Jake, are expecting a baby. A great granddaughter and the first of the next generation. This exciting news shifted my whole perspective. You see, both on the track and in his life story, Dad was a great distance runner. He was fit and in good shape physically, mentally, and spiritually. He paced himself well and ran a good race, but he was not closing in on the finish line because it was never an individual race. It was a relay. He was passing the baton to us, to all of us. So now it's time for us to make sure that we are fit and in good shape to pick up the pace and to run the next leg of the relay. Like our dad, let's give it all we've got. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Sleep in peace, mangatus and tak for all.
Two roads diverge in the yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <sighs> Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I'm uh, Rolf Jacobson, a uh, cousin of the Erdals through uh, their mom, Ellen, and I've been blessed to be influenced so much through the, all of the Erdals. Lowell was my pastor and the bishop uh, when I was ordained, and of course Arlen and Ellen and their kids meant so much to us. I did think somebody would tell this joke, so I have to do it, which is, the Erdahl twins, one went into politics and the other was elected to Congress. <laughs> now therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that it may be clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. Rolf and Carrie, Eric, John, Lars, and Molly, Laura and Scott, 
Kari and Eric, Fred, grandchildren, cousins, neighbors, friends, grace to you and peace from God, the Father and the Lord Jesus. Amen. Alan Erdahl was a treasure. He was a treasure in an earthen vessel for those with eyes to see. His parents, Christian and Ingeborg, certainly saw Arlen and twin brother Lowell as treasures in earthen vessels. And they had them baptized into Christ's death and resurrection on April 19th, 1931. And as Paul writes, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. They were baptized because the world into which they were born is broken. The Christian name for this brokenness is sin. The before sin is something we do or don't do, it is the condition into which all of us are born. It's a condition which leads to so many things like children having polio or cancer and humans sinning against each other and against the creation and therefore against God. Human sins can be small, irritating things. Human sin can be massive, genocidal things. Maybe you've noticed God's children singing, sinning against each other in the Holy Land in Ukraine. God's children sinning against each other in South Sudan, Liberia, and Guatemala, in Minneapolis and St. Paul. The flood story in Genesis teaches us that God is so grieved by human sin that God briefly considered washing his hands of the whole thing and drowning us. But God chose a different answer for sin, and that is to wash our sins away and drown them in baptism. God's answer to human violence is not force, but forgiveness. What a strange God to respond to our violence with forgiveness rather than force. That's the promise into which Arlen was baptized, and that promise was with him all the days of his life. It's not just a one-time thing. It's something to be claimed every day. So Arlen grew up in those baptismal promises. He married his wife, Ellen, and the two of them stood together a few years later when another little sinner was baptized. I was blessed all my life to have Arlen Erdahl as my godfather. When I was young, it was kind of cool to have a really prominent person as godfather, secretary of state. Later, he was my congressman. But as I grew older, I was more impressed to have a thoughtful, faithful, humble, and deeply kind man as a role model of what it is to follow Jesus. Now, a lot of nice things have been said about Arlen, but we need to say at least some of the weaknesses too. Arlen Erdahl was too nice to be a politician in today's America. Alice Roosevelt famously said, if you don't have anything nice to say, sit next to me. She would not have wanted to sit next to Arlen because he did his best to live by the saying, if you don't have anything nice to say about a person, say nothing at all. You can win a lot of friends that way, but it's hard to win an election that way these days. But I have to disagree. I, do, I would rather sit next to Arlen. He had another weakness, singing. <laughs> Alice Roosevelt probably would not have wanted to sit next to Arlen in worship. Eric said at Ellen's funeral, Mom was given a voice. We marry our opposites. <laughs> Rolf said, I should say, let me rephrase that. My tastefully named cousin Rolf said, he couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. But Psalm 100 says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. It's not about the quality of singing and worship. It's that we are here to praise God. Now, my cousin and senior colleague in the ministry, Paul Rowe, said it was important for me to follow the family tradition of improving the family and that we improve the family by marrying quality people and improving the gene pool. My wife, Amy, would certainly agree with that. Arlen hit it out of the ball, excuse me, Ellen hit it out of the ballpark when she married Arlen, and both in quality and in quantity, the Erdals have greatly added to our family. Born into a farm family, Arlen was keenly in touch with creation, as uh, his sons have already noted, and Kari wrote that his faith was expressed with simple glances up to the beautiful clouds, 
His faith was rooted in gratitude and appreciation for the world. And he expressed his faith through kindness and acceptance of people everywhere he went. Laura added, Dad was honored to serve in Congress, but throughout all of his years, his favorite place, places to be were the farm and the cottage. And Lars tied it all together. He wrote me this. When he was first elected to the Minnesota legislator in 1962, a farm neighbor told him, Erdahl, never forget where you come from. He had many impressive titles over the years, but he was never too impressed by titles not his own. He never forgot where he came from. He was always a farm kid from near Blue Earth in Faribault County, the product of a one-room schoolhouse, a proud American and Minnesotan, an authentic and faithful Norwegian, Lutheran, a fellow child of God saved by grace. Now Arlen was strong. His earthen vessel was made with extraordinary power. He was a farmer, three-sport athlete, a soldier, and a public servant. And he leveraged that strength to become an advocate for those who were less strong. Specifically, he was an advocate for the disabled, in part because of his love for Lowell, but mostly because he had compassion for others. His earthen vessel had extraordinary power and was long lived. But in the end, even the strongest of us weakens and dies. He fought dementia for at least 12 years. It was 12 years that it was diagnosed. And the dementia that claimed his faculties was difficult for all of us who loved him. Arlen was so strong that even when his cerebral functions diminished, his body would not quit. He passed his strengths down to his children, however, and it was inspiring to see the six of you use the strength you inherited from your father and mother to care for him in his dementia, especially Eric. The Lutheran Christian faith baptizes infants because we believe that baptism is not the act of the person, but of God. God's promises to Arlen were authentic and authoritative even when he was baptized before he could comprehend. And God's promises to Arlen remained authentic and authoritative right to the end as his comprehension was diminished. In life and in death, Arlen was a living witness to what Paul eloquently says about all of us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that it may be clear that the extraordinary power belongs to God. So let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Glory be to God for the life and love of Arlen, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please stand as able for the hymn.
God has made us one people through our baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, in holy baptism, you have knit your chosen people together into one communion of saints in the body of Christ. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Give courage and faith to all who mourn and a sure and certain hope in your loving care that casting all their sorrow on you, they may have strength for the days ahead. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith, that where this world groans in grief and pain, your Holy Spirit may lead us to bear witness to your light and life. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Help us in the midst of things we cannot understand to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. God of mercy, hear our prayer. We bless you, O God, for your servant Arlen. His life revealed your image and brought light to the lives of many. We have seen in his friendship your compassion, in his weakness your strength. In his humility, your glory. In his integrity, your goodness. In his faithfulness, glimpses of your eternal love. Strengthen our faith so that we too may trust that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus, that your life is now Ireland's and will one day be ours. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you so much for being here today, for supporting the family and honoring Arlen as we give thanks for his life. We hope you'll join us for lunch afterwards. It will be served downstairs in Iverson Hall. There are stairs at the back of the sanctuary. And if you would prefer to use an elevator, one is available near the entrance um, the main entrance in the south lot, it's behind the blue wall. Let us commend Arland now to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Arlen. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of all the saints in light. Amen.
us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ, amen.